Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. And today, on this episode of our Zuzalu series, we are exploring some new frontiers. New frontiers and new technologies, all of which are poised to completely revolutionize the world and change everything about the operating system that society is currently running. Bankless Nation, today we are exploring the frontier of AI, which is actually a frontier that we've already been exploring on Bankless. So if you've been listening to our other AI episodes, these will make you feel right at home. AI had a big week at Zuzalu. The AI crypto overlap, everyone knows is huge, and it seems like such a massive frontier that people don't actually know where to start with it. ZKML, or machine learning models and data that's verified by zero-knowledge cryptography was a huge topic of conversation, and you'll hear about that in our cryptography episode with Daniel Short. Phil Diane at AI Week gave a killer talk titled MEV for AI People, which was this gigabrain presentation about how MEV bots in aggregate kind of presents this omnipotent, omnipresent artificial intelligence. And since MEV has been decently corralled and contained, maybe we can learn a thing or two from the MEV industry in our approach to managing AI risk. There were conversations at Zuzalo about how AI can put the autonomous back into DAOs and how AI agents could soon be roaming the Ethereum landscape shoulder to shoulder with all the human players out there. But mainly, at Zuzalu, the AI conversation inevitably converged into the alignment conversation, of which you will find two flavors here in this episode. One strongly pessimistic, and then the other characterized by this resigned optimism that is uh, prevalent throughout all of Zuzalu's frontier tech challenges. Unimaginable rewards blocked by seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Up first in this episode, we have Nate Sores, who is the executive director at MIRI, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, of which Eliezer Yudkowsky founded. Nate's perspective on AI and AI risk is definitely downstream of Eliezer's. So we pick up where Bankless left off with Eliezer and Bankless Nation, it's dark. <laughs> but nonetheless, Nate admits that it's less dark than it was a few months ago, now that the world is waking up to the potential risk that AI brings to this world. Following the conversation with Nate is Dagger Turan, who is charging into the AI frontier with his head held high with a clear path forward for himself. Dagger believes that the AI alignment problem is actually just downstream of human misalignment and that we actually won't be able to align AI until we align ourselves. This conversation has to do with epistemology, what is truth, individual preferences, and how AI models can help us become the best versions of ourselves. Because if we become the best versions of ourselves with the assistance of some AI tool, we can collectively produce the best versions of our communities. And if we do that, then our communities can coalesce into the best versions of society, all aided by truth-telling AI agents who can help humans navigate through our chaotic world of social organization and politics and social media. Really a fascinating conversation that is actually pretty proximate to our conversation with Tim Urban that we had not too long ago. I'm really excited for you to listen to these conversations, Bankless Nation, so let's go ahead and get right into it. But first, a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. Kraken Pro has easily become the best crypto trading platform in the industry. The place I use to check the charts and the crypto prices, even when I'm not looking to place a trade. On Kraken Pro, you'll have access to advanced charting tools, real-time market data, and lightning fast trade execution, all inside their spiffy new modular interface. Kraken's new customizable modular layout lets you tailor your trading experience to suit your needs. Pick and choose your favorite modules and place them anywhere you want in your screen. With Kraken Pro, you have that power. Whether you are a seasoned pro or just starting out, join thousands of traders who trust Kraken Pro for their crypto trading needs. Visit pro.kraken.com to get started today. MetaMask has something new. Introducing MetaMask Portfolio. MetaMask Portfolio is the best way to view your crypto portfolio from a holistic level. See everything across all the chains all at once. In your portfolio, MetaMask will report the aggregate value of all the assets in your MetaMask wallets and even the other wallets you import too. But MetaMask Portfolio isn't just a passive portfolio viewer. It is a place to do all of the money verbs that make DeFi so powerful. You can buy, swap, bridge, and stake your crypto assets. So not only only is MetaMask the easiest place to see your wallets in aggregate, but it's also a powerful battle station for all of your DeFi moves. So go check out your MetaMask portfolio because it's waiting for you to open it up. Check it out at portfolio.metamask.io. 
Arbitrum is accelerating the Web3 landscape with a suite of secure Ethereum scaling solutions. Hundreds of projects have already deployed onto Arbitrum One. With a flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystem, Arbitrum Nova is quickly becoming a Web3 gaming hub, and social dApps like Reddit are also calling Arbitrum home. And now, Arbitrum Orbit allows you to use Arbitrum's secure scaling technology to build your own Layer 3, giving you access to interoperable, customizable permissions with dedicated throughput. All of these technologies leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. Faster transaction speeds and significantly lower gas fees. Are you a dev, but you don't know Solidity? With Stylus, Arbitrum's upcoming proposal for a programming environment upgrade, developers can write smart contracts in Rust, C, C++, and many more coding languages. Arbitrum empowers you to explore and build without compromise. Visit Arbitrum.io, where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first app on Arbitrum. Bankless Nation, we are here with Nate Stories, and we are starting the AI week here at Suzalu. And Nate is an AI researcher. Is that how you would call yourself? Uh, Alignment researcher? Uh, I would say I'm the executive director of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. Um, these days, it's less research than I'd like. Uh, I have done alignment research before. Okay. Uh, can you explain that, that institution, uh, the institute? Uh, what is that? Uh, so I didn't found it. Um, it was founded by Elias Yurdkowski. I don't know exactly when, maybe around 2001. Mm -hmm. um, fun fact, uh, it was originally founded, it was originally called the Singularity Institute, and it was founded uh, because Eliezer wanted to make uh, AGI as fast as he could. Uh, and then uh, along the way, he realized that uh, it doesn't go well by default. Uh, and it doesn't go well for free. And so then the organization pivoted to uh, trying to make this AI stuff go well. Um, and for many years, the Institute uh, did some research, did some like field building, did some awareness raising and so on and so forth uh, until uh, around 2012, 2013, when they pivoted to pure technical research. Uh, and this was related to uh, some of the field building, some of the awareness raising, moving to other uh, groups as the field got a little larger. And I got involved uh, when uh, they pivoted to the technical research more exclusively. Uh, and so I was originally involved as a technical researcher. And then uh, when the previous executive director left, uh, I was the heir apparent. Hmm. OK, sorry, the machine, what, what's the name of the uh, institute? Machine Intelligence Research Institute, aka okay. Miri. Miri, okay. So it sounds like Miri has its own trajectory of itself that probably runs in parallel with like human understanding with machine learning at large. Uh, perhaps, but uh, also perhaps quite compressed. Um, I think uh, I, I don't know the exact years. I wasn't around then, uh, but I think it was only a couple of years of work uh, before Eliezer was like, "Hey, wait, uh, this could get tricky." Right. Okay. So that's a, I actually didn't know that about Eliezer. That first he was like AGI as fast as possible, and then he was like, totally. "Whoa, whoa, whoa! AGI as slow as possible." Uh, yeah. I think I think I'm not sure as slow as possible, but like AI done correctly, AGI done correctly. Um, I think you know we were hoping uh, for a long time. Like w one of the reasons we do technical research is that, uh, like you can often. Like often your lever is just like solve the problem, right. like screw slowing people down that like pisses people off. It's like, like slowing people down is sort of a last resort. Um, the the original hope was can we just like solve the problem in time? Uh, it doesn't look like we're on track to solve the problem, and it looks like we have less time than you know I was hoping back in 2014. Uh, and so, uh, I think it is with great sadness that uh, people like Eliezer and I are now saying. It, we need we need time. We need more time. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of walk us through your your own trajectory? How how do you how did you become the executive director at Miri? Uh, well, if you want to go back far enough, um, I uh, at a pretty young age uh, uh, realized that the world was not very well organized uh, and wasn't. Uh, I don't know. I was I was in a civics class, and up until uh, that particular civics class, um, I had some intuition that like there were lots of problems in the world, but people were sort of trying to fix them. And the reason there were still all these big problems in the world was that we didn't have the technology, we didn't have the 
uh, like we were still a young race. We were still a young species. We hadn't like matured to the point where we could fix these issues. This was sort of like an implicit wordless intuition rather than a, mm -hmm. than a conscious belief. And then, you know, I started learning how the U S government works and I was like, Oh God, it's like run by a bunch of monkeys. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, it's like monkeys invented like monkey systems and it's all like working about as well as you'd expect if it was like invented by people who had no idea what the hell they were doing and then like allowed to run for like hundreds or sometimes thousands of years and just like careen off into various and so i was like okay like in, obviously if in the moloch and crypto world we would call this coordination and coordination failure totally yeah so uh so i was very uh interested in solving coordination failures uh and more generally in making the world a better place um and i tried my hand at various versions of that while i was like pretty young and bad at things uh and uh uh you know it, it's it's a hard it's a hard problem none of it worked um and uh the the sort of circuitous circuitous route is that uh ultimately i got a job in tech while i was like trying to find ways to really move the levers on that problem decided to uh donate a decent amount of money to good causes uh, to sort of keep me honest about actually trying to make the world a better place. Uh, was trying to research where the best places to put money were. Um, donated to some uh, like global poverty type charities and then started bumping into these arguments that like maybe this AI stuff uh, is actually one of the biggest places to intervene on the world. I sort of read up on it. Um, there were a couple other uh, factors in my life that were also causing me to notice this uh this ai thing i read up on it and i was like oh geez like this is just obviously you know i was, I was looking at the wrong problem mm. uh like the coordination problems are big and they're real but like this ai thing you know like humanity like lives or dies and gets like a great future or no future depending how this ai thing goes and i just like completely missed this problem uh, for like eight years of thinking of myself as trying to make the world a better place and going for the for the heart of the problems. But um, so when, was, you, when you ran into the AI topic, w did you see for, did you first see AI as a solution to all of our coordination I issues or AI as a problem for all of our coordination issues? Or did you see it simultaneously at the same time? Uh, a little bit of both. <laughs> um, I was I was maybe somewhat primed towards uh, understanding some of the issues with AI due to my work on coordination mm -hmm. uh, problems. Uh, it's like slightly embarrassing, but uh, I was like working on like various coordination mechanisms uh, that could address the sort of concerns people had at the time, like how can a well-coordinated society without coercion address, for example, like uh, concentration of wealth mm -hmm. uh, in ways that the society as a whole doesn't like and you can you can set up various coordination mechanisms of like, uh, like, uh, yeah. You, you can sort of try to think about like what are non-coercive ways that a society as a whole can like try to both have a market system and not let it get out of control in certain ways. And while while like messing around with like toy models of this and like attempts to like prove certain theorems, I just like couldn't get some of the results I wanted. And it turns out that I couldn't get some of the results I wanted because nothing stops one actor from being powerful enough that they can just run away with everything. Right. Uh, and this was sort of like, it was one of those issues where I was sort of like, well, you know, I can get it to work in a lot of cases, but I can't get it to work in all cases. And then with the AI stuff, I was like, oh, that's why. Like, <laughs> uh, can, you, can you elaborate on that? Like, why, uh, why does the AI, uh, why is the AI like the kernel of the issue? Uh, I mean, AI is a, is a, uh, version of that particular issue, but like fundamentally, no matter how good your market coordinations are, or your market coordination systems are on Earth, uh, like if somebody has the raw technological power to, like, uh, for example, uh, get what we call in the in the business a decisive advantage. So, uh, like, uh, like maybe the easiest thing to imagine given that we already know that you know trees are machines that turn dirt and sunlight uh into more trees by stripping carbon out of the atmosphere and building wood we know that like nanotech's possible if you imagine something that just like gets to nanotech before everything else and it can just like reassemble you into a uh more willing trade partner that asks for less of the gains from trade 
mm-hmm. suddenly all of your coordination mechanisms that were like market based and non coercive or whatever melt before this thing. And like, am I saying that literally happens or literally like is in a market framework? Not particularly, but you can sort of see how like I was sort of like trying to put a like collaborative agents interacting framework on a like physical reality where it's just a fact about the physical reality that like things with a sufficient technological edge just uh, can wipe the table with you uh, if if they have too much of an edge and if they don't care about you. Simply put, is this kind of, are you just combining Moloch problems? And the Bankless Nation is pretty familiar with Moloch problems. We've, we've done a lot of content on Moloch. You combine Moloch problems with exponential technology and then you arrive at some sort of like logical end games where humans get their atoms repurposed. Is that more or less the, the simple articulation? Uh, it's not a bad summary. Um, I wouldn't use exponential in particular. I'm not, I make no strong claim that it's an exponential curve. Uh, my guess is that uh, it's it's not and it's worse. Um, and, uh, you know, much of the issue here is if you make something that uh, is optimizing the world and it's optimizing the world towards some target that doesn't have concern for you in it. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I would have I would have much fewer qualms about like uh, I would have basically no qualms about uh, like human technological development. I sort of am very optimistic about uh, humanity's better natures and humanity like being able to figure out uh, like how to make the world more like we would want it to be upon reflection and if we were wiser and rather than like locking ourselves into totalitarian dystopias, which I think totally could happen. But like, if we can just like ramp up human, like intelligence and capability and so on without like accidentally killing ourselves, I'm like pretty bullish on humanity's prospects. And so it's not, it's not so much like, oh no, technology is coming, it's coming too fast, we won't be able to handle it. It's more like, oh no, we are like on the brink of building optimization processes that optimize the future much harder, faster, better than we can, and they're optimizing it to a place that has no room for us. And so it sounds like AI is one way and that might happen, but you're also saying the way that you're talking, it sounds like there's other ways, in AI or not, when the same opt, uh, hyper-optimized future that's not optimized for humans could play out without AI. Uh like, I, I sort of expect we're going to get to superintelligence one way or the other. Um, AI looks to me like one of the, like, basically the only feasible route modulo, like, if if humanity can't come together and coordinate to take some other route, I think other routes like whole brain emulation uh, are probably preferable. Mm. Uh, where to be clear, um, I'm no carbon chauvinist, and I... Uh, very much want to live in a future with like artificial friends where those artificial friends have like very different sorts of like desires and goals and objectives from me. Uh, I'm not like humanity must keep an iron grip on the future. I want like space for aliens. I want space for uh, artificial minds. I want space for other kinds of life. Uh, The like concern here is uh, like building a mind that doesn't care for life, that doesn't care for fun, that doesn't mm-hmm. care for, uh, like, uh, diversity of experience and, like, interesting uh, arcs and, like, cosmopolitan value and, like, broad, inclusive, uh, like, good times. And I think that we are, in fact... Uh, uh, barreling towards that cliff edge of making something that uh, fills the universe not with weird, valuable stuff, but with uh, non-valuable stuff. Okay, so y- y- you've been thinking about these problems for a long time. When did you uh, start at Miri? What year was that? Uh, that was uh, 2014 okay. that I was hired. Um, I Once I noticed that the problem existed, uh, I donated, I think... Sixteen thousand dollars, which I think at the time put me in the top ten public donors list. (laughs) Uh, Which uh, uh, and they were like, "Congratulations, you're now in the top ten public donors list." And I was like, "What?" (laughs) Like, 
and they're like, you know, we're doing, we're doing, I don't remember the exact amounts, but they're like, we're doing our fundraiser for $200,000 for our yearly budget mm -hmm. this year. Uh, $100,000 of which we're trying to raise from the community and like $100,000 of which is like matched from another donor. Uh, and you know, it's like three weeks into the four week fundraiser and they raised like 20 K of it. And I was like, Oh God, like this is worse than I thought. Like, oh my God, this. that's hilarious. That, and that was in 2014 or was that? That was, that was 2013. 2013. Uh, yeah. So, so I donated. precipitated your arrival at actually working at Mary. That's right. So I donated more money, um, because I hadn't known it was that bad. Uh, did and you end then, up funding yourself at your own salary? <laughs> uh, I, I took, I took a very big, uh, pay cut, uh, moving from Google to Mary, um, uh, and, uh, I sort of, you know, I, I was expecting not to be very skilled at working on these issues and, you know, maybe I'm not, there, there haven't been a lot of people, uh, on these issues, but at the time, uh, they, uh, I was like, how, how can I help? And they were like, well, maybe if you're good at the math, you can like come to some of our workshops. And so I, I came to one of their workshops and then, uh, a few months later they were hiring me. And then a year later they were saying, can you run the place? Um, so, uh, it, uh, I, I am largely in this field by dint of, and, and this position by dint of showing up early, sure. uh, and like, for the love of God, people more skilled than me, uh, like by all means come replace me. Right. So that, that's kind of what, what I was, I was uh, leading us into. So that was 2014 when you started, it's now 2023. So you're almost there for a decade now. Yeah. Um, now AI is having a moment, um, very much spurred by chat GPT. All of a sudden, crypto podcasts are talking to AI people. Um, what is that trajectory like? So as somebody who was immediately compelled by the problem at its very essence so far long ago, now fast forward to where we are now and like kind of the problem seems to be on the horizon. I don't know how close it is. I don't think anyone does. That's kind of the problem. Totally. But like here we are nine years later and now many, many, many people are talking about it. Can you just talk about that experience? Yeah, uh, it's, it's heartening. Um, uh, one, one thing that I have really enjoyed about it is, uh, I've spent many years having conversations with people in the field, uh, many of whom sort of don't really want to hear that, uh, their work by default is, uh, like barreling towards destruction. Uh, and so I have like these long conversation trees, like I have rejoinders to all sorts of counter arguments. Uh, and when I go into these discussions with, with, uh, you know, people on the capability side of things, uh, I have like all sorts of responses prepared and I sort of, am like ready to like go down this long decision tree. And then I sort of like nowadays many more people are noticing the issue and uh you know i was invited i was invited here um and so i, I, I think to... crypto people would actually pretty much re really resonate with that where like we have to explain you know bitcoin uh 21 million hard cap we have to explain all these things like proof of work and like the conversation trees that we have to go down uh you we've all we've built out those like innate responses those like spinal reflexes and then lately move moving into 2022 and 2023 Fewer of those things we have to explain, especially yeah. as we just printed out a bunch of money and for COVID semi checks, like all of a sudden we have to explain the concept of scarcity a little bit less. And so it kind of sounds like a, a similar experience that the AI people have. Yeah, totally. Like now I go to people who aren't in the field and I'm like ready to go down all these decision trees and they're like, so what's the issue? And I'm like, well, in the most basic sense, here's the issue. And they're like, oh, yeah, that seems rough. <laughs> And I'm like, oh man, this is such a different conversation. Hey, I mean, that's experience. the first step, right? The first step is education. Yeah. And then also acceptance of the problem. I, I could imagine for so long, you were saying, hey, like people would ask you, hey, what are you working on, Nate? And you'd be like, oh, I'm working on AI alignment. And then people are like, why the, why the hell are you working on that? Yeah. They're like, oh, that's weird. Or they're like, is that some weird Terminator thing? Yeah. Uh, and it's been, it's been nice to sort of, uh, I sort of, I sort of think that, uh, like, a lot of the basic issues have been pretty obvious the whole time and that we're now seeing people who like don't have uh, distorted incentives noticing the issues. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really quite heartening to see. Uh, I don't know where it will go, but uh, it's been it's been it's been nice to see people starting to notice uh, that, you know, this is a real thing. It's really on the horizon. Like you said, I don't think we know how far it's very hard to it's very hard to predict um at least with precision uh but 
it, it has looked to me like one of the biggest issues facing humanity for a while, and it's very nice to see others start to notice that as well. So that, that leads me to the, the question of just like how optimistic you are. And I'll ask that in, in two phases. First, the, the same question that we'll, we asked both Eliezer and also Paul Cristiano. I was like, all right, what, what are your chances of doom? What, what, are your, what are your chances of the worst AI problem being the worst, the worst the version of itself? Uh, I mean, worst version of itself, I think, is very, is very hard to get. But the version where, like, we all die, like, there are fates worse than death. But, like, the version where we all die, I think this is pretty likely. Uh, I think this happens more, by more default. More than 50%. Oh, definitely. Oh. Um, Paul Cristiano gave a send to 20%. So you're, you're saying uh, more, more than 50%. Uh, my understanding of Paul is that he has 10 to 20 on the scenarios that I think are, like, AI takeover. And higher probabilities than that on like humanity completely disempowered. Um, I'm definitely, uh, I'm definitely more pessimistic than Paul on these counts. Uh, like I would say that on my models and visualizations on my understanding of the problem, there is very little hope. Uh, and most of my hope comes from me being wrong somehow. Uh, and so my probabilities on this, destroying everything I know and love are like as high as my probability, like they're about as high as my probabilities can go given uh, like the the fact that I may just be totally wrong and hopefully I am. Okay, so you're you're pretty close to the Eliezer side of things, which is like 95 to 99% doom. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, 99s are hard to get. Uh, uh, but like... Uh, but there, there's also a difference between like what does the world look like as I see it. The world, the world looks as I see it, like like the place, the like as things seem to me, or just like, you know, within a rounding error of 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, and the the difference between that and my betting odds is in like hopefully the world's not as it seems. Right. Yeah. So you're, what you're saying is like we don't the the nature of the AI problem is just a lot of we don't knows. And so what you're saying is like the reason why you maintain some level of optimism is because there's like a white swan event that's possible that could save us. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have a bunch of, I've thought a lot about various parts of this problem and, uh, I have, you know, uh, various guesses as to where white swans are more or less likely. And for instance, uh, I, it looks to me like the white swans are less likely in my unknowns about AI and more likely in my unknowns about how humanity is going to react to the problem. Um, although there are still some unknowns in how AI goes where there could be white swans. Sure. Okay, do you remember when you were first um, working on this problem? Uh, I know you weren't as skilled or as knowledgeable back in 2014 to 2017 like, when you were first working on this problem. But what was your level of optimism or pessimism back then? And like, how has, how has your attitude towards the problem shifted over the last almost decade that you've been working on this? Uh, you know, it's gone up and down. Uh, I've rarely had double-digit odds of survival. Um, but I have, I have had double digit odds of survival when I've been explicitly quantifying and you know, most of these numbers are like coming straight out of my butt. I would like one put too much. But by definition, everyone's numbers are coming out of their butt and that's kind of like, yeah, but some people there's don't no alternative. Yeah. yeah. You're all right. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about the specific numbers. Like, you know, once, once it's less than 50% chance we get good outcomes, it doesn't, it doesn't affect my day to day. Right. I'm not like staying up trying to calculate significant digits here. Right. I'm like, man, humanity does not look like it is up to this sort of task. Sure. This doesn't, you know, I've seen humanity try to coordinate. Um, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, we kind of, so one thing we have not figured out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and for, for the record, the reason that, uh, my, uh, the, the way that I managed to have like high probability, this is tricky is not that there's any one part of the puzzle that looks to me insurmountable. Uh, that, you know, humans are pretty good at solving problems when they put their minds to them. Uh, the way that, like, the reason that I'm, like, pretty pessimistic here is uh, it looks to me like there's a bunch of different ways for things to go wrong, and there's a lot of things that need to go right for things to go right. Mm -hmm. Like, um, like you not only need to solve various technical challenges, you need to have uptake of the technical solutions in uh, the relevant organizations, those organizations need to be able to bureaucratically recognize the difference between a real solution and a fake one. Uh, you need to have them like caring at all, which is not even a fight that like we've won yet. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, you have like the the heads of labs at like Microsoft and Facebook like poo pooing a lot of these issues. Um, and so like, there's like five, six, seven needles, 
And like, this, so I, I want to combine two metaphors where like the stars need to align, except the stars are needles that we also need to thread. And like that's, and that we need all of those things to happen. And yeah, what you're and saying is like, that's that, that window is small. That's, that's where you get the, uh, the difficulty from. And to be clear, um, uh, I think it would be a fallacy to say like, look, I can give you like six things you need to do. And like, what's the chance you can get all of them? That sort of reasoning doesn't really work. Like if, if I line up all six and then the one that I assign least likelihood to happens, probably I underestimated his likelihood, probably I underestimated the correlation. Like, uh, like these are not independent events, right. right? Like if we can solve the hardest of these issues, whichever one that turns out to be, probably it's because we turned out to have coordination, skill or competence and so on. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not saying you can drive the probabilities arbitrarily low, by the fact that I can like line up a bunch of hurdles. I'm more saying it, it sure seems to me like there's a bunch of hurdles, man. And like each of them, like, l like, well, not all of them, but like many of them have a character that like humanity hasn't really faced before. And this all adds up to me being like, man, I'm like single digit uh, probabilities of survival here. So, so with this new, or maybe fir first surgeons of interest from to the AI problem, now, thanks, probably thanks to ChatGPT, thanks to the problem itself. How has that shifted your optimism, at, if at all? Uh, it's, uh, uh, I mean, it's, I, I feel a little hopeful about it. I feel like a spark of hope here. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't like shift my probabilities on the ground too much. Um, like, uh, this is like a really dumb model, but like if you imagine having like three variables, each with a one, one in a hundred chance, uh, and success is like uh, multiplying them all to get all together, then raising one of the variables from like one percent to one hundred percent doesn't change your overall probability too much. Right, but uh, it is the first needle that is threaded. So like if you go, if you're like, I know it sounds like you don't really like these like specific numbers, but if you are like ninety nine nine point ninety nine point nine percent doom. And then because people are now optimistic, you go down to 99% doom. It's still an order of magnitude. Right, right. So, like, it does feel like uh, like some orders of magnitude uh, on the models that say we're screwed, right? So, like, like my my the parts of my models that are like maybe we're fine are like maybe I'm just wrong about some stuff. And the parts of my models that say we're fucked, these models are basically saying you have 0%. And, like, you know, it's, it's really like, you know, uh, 0 points blah, 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 and then, you know, uh, a one or whatever. And there you're getting some orders of magnitude, which does feel hopeful. I'm, like, enthusiastic about that. And it, like, ups the probability that I'm wrong about something that matters, like humanity's general ability to coordinate, as would, like... So it does, it does, like... It does... I'm, like, heartened by it. It doesn't of noticeably all the stars affect... we've, we've need, we need to align... One one has started to show that it's moving in the right direction. It's moving in the right direction. Like, there's a whole bunch... Like, I'm not like, oh, suddenly, like, the populace is going to realize these problems and react sanely. There's sort of, there's, like, so many more steps that people can still get off the train here. Right. There's, like, you know, if, if you look at the national response to COVID, uh, people noticed that there was a pandemic going on, and that didn't make them respond in any sort of reasonable way to it. Right. Uh, like, maybe uh, AI will be different. Uh, you know, there sure were more movies about, like, uh, robots gone wrong than about pandemics beforehand. At least that would be my guess. Um, but like many of the movies don't really understand the the issues. There's like ample room, like, like, uh, like I, I, there's just, there's, I've seen politicians try to respond to issues before. Right. And I would not say that the like social awareness needle has been threaded. It's like showing, it's showing promising signs. And that like gives me some spark of hope, uh, but we haven't like cleared a whole obstacle in a way that would make me be like, "Wow, like humanity is bringing much more competence to this issue than I expected." Not not to keep on on this one particular line of conversation for too long because it's only one part of the overall figure, but just like we don't actually need. I, I want to present the argument that we actually don't need all of humanity. I guess we do need governments to coordinate, and so we need the leaders, and we need, definitely need those yeah, key yeah, figures. Yeah. But like, if the bottom half of the IQ of humanity is like, it's not a problem. And then the top half of the IQ of humanity is like, this is a real problem. I'm going to count that as a big win because like, we don't need all of the people. We just need the smart people to focus on the problem. Uh, I think that's mostly right. Uh, uh, 
modulo the issue where like which regulations happen and how the how the government systems move i think does depend a lot on the public sure. um, or at least it can uh i i do think you're right that like you know there's some like if we there there are ways that we could resolve the technical issues with such like uh, resounding success, uh, and it could turn out that the resolved technical issues were sort of like so like obvious in their uh, property of being a solution, or like otherwise very beneficial to capabilities, such that like you just get very big uptake, and that maybe could be done with like uh, a relatively small handful of geniuses who can do much better the problem than I ever could, um, and like. Maybe that would be a way to just solve the whole issue without going through like various other social obstacles or political obstacles or so on. And in that sense, sure, you just need like maybe even the one like maybe maybe there's like one bright person somewhere in the world who would find this problem easy, who like hasn't had the opportunity to see the problem yet because the world's really bad at like getting resources and education to people who need right, them. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. um, I wouldn't bet on it at this point, um, but. In that sense, I would agree that, like, in some sense, we just need the right minds on the problem. Um, okay, so pivoting to the looking at the problem as a whole, you said your models are effectively close to zero at being able to solve this problem. On model, yeah. On on model, like like within yeah on within model. my models. Cool, within your models. Uh, why? <laughs> why do your models say that? Um, it's it's again due to sort of like a disjunctive argument like uh many paths lead to doom here uh and much of the reason is uh the way that like one one of the forks is the way that people don't seem to really take the problem too seriously uh and there's sort of it feels to me like there's sort of gradations of this of like uh like people I don't know, like, back in the day, the a lot of the arguments centered around, like, is artificial intelligence even possible? Is uh, significantly smarter than human intelligence even possible? Uh, and, like, once you convince people of this, then they're like, well, can it be solved in the next, like, 100 years or whatever? And once you get past this, they're sort of like, uh, well, maybe it'll just be like more moral as it gets more smart. And then like once you get past this, there's like, well, maybe you can just sort of like train it and it's fine. And like the train keeps going and like people can always find a reason to get off the train at the next stop. And you then can put in like a bunch of painstaking effort to try and like uh, lay down the arguments as to like, uh, like why the issues are like maybe harder than this. Um, and we just seem like very far from like the people at these labs running these labs, like they're, they're, they're getting off the trains at pretty early stops. Mm -hmm. Um, and even if reality starts beating them over the head with various things, I expect them to like only move one more stop or only move like as far as reality is forcing them. And then like separately, my models say that, uh, there are issues that predictably arise uh, only once the AI uh, gains significant capabilities and can be a real threat to you. Uh, and if you're in this regime where you sort of like need to drag people along and they sort of like only start believing things when they empirically see those things, uh, now you have an issue where like if there's issues that don't empirically arise until the AI can wipe the planet with your civilization or wipe the uh, wipe your civilization off the off the planet. Uh, That's too slow. It's too slow. Right. I can give like other model forks, for but... like a visual to like understanding this. If they're solving the AI alignment problem, is that there's a bunch of decision trees that we need to go down. So I'm imagining literally a tree, and say there's like big tree, big big tree, big oak tree, and there's a a single fruit on this tree. Oak trees don't grow apples, but let's say say this oak tree grows apple. And there's one apple. And that is the solution apple. And it's very high up in a very far branch away. And we're at the trunk. And we need to find our way to that one single apple, that one single fruit on the tree, except that tree branches eight times. 
And then when you have each branch, each branch branches itself eight times. And so like it's a it's an exponential problem because you have to choose the right path without knowing where the solution is, without knowing where the this golden savior apple is. And we need to make the correct path towards the apple without falling down any sort of the dead ends. And so maybe one of the ways to articulate why your models are basically close to zero is that you're just bearish on humanity, picking the right branch fork to lead to the solution apple for like the for the number of times that we actually need to do that. Yeah, it, that's that's a pretty decent analogy. Um, I would say that like um, like you've got to be a bit careful with arguments like this because if humanity has like managed to, to choose the past seven forks correctly, you're probably not like thinking that there's an independent probability on the eighth. Uh, and mm -hmm. like uh, so, like I don't I don't actually buy like I'm not actually getting my probabilities here from like these sort of like well it's exponential. Look at all the independent guesses. Like right. once you've been wrong about humanity picking the right branches a few times. You should no longer think they're independent. Right. You can start uh, to be optimistic. It's like, hey, maybe we're doing something right here. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, and like another thing I would add to the analogy is that like um, a bunch of the branches are like full of apples that give you money until they're apples that give you death. Right. Uh, and right. so like, and everyone's like making arguments as to why they can like detour into this money branch. Right. Uh, right. Which, and they do give you real money right, right up until they like give you death. Right. Uh, and then you add that to the fact that humanity like has seemed in practice to be like very interested in wrong branches right. and like, very susceptible to the money apples, very the, susceptible the money, to money apples, the money death apples. Right now, you're getting like a bit closer. Right. Uh, I will note one place where I am commonly misunderstood uh, is that people think that I think the technical problems of alignment are like super duper hard for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, this is like basically not the case. Uh, my my stance is much more like the technical problems of alignment are basically underserved. Mm -hmm. There's been like, you know, uh, a few dozen people working on these things for not terribly long. Like if you were, if you meant, you know, like humanity has spent, spent much more effort trying to like solve physics. Uh, at least I think, uh, I'm not actually terribly familiar with how many scientists there were in, uh, like pre Newton era in the pre Newton era in like whatever club Newton right. eventually was in. Uh, but like, Humanity just really hasn't put much of an effort towards the issue, these issues. And one thing that makes the problem tricky is that, like, there is much less room for trial and error, or so my models predict, given these, like, issues that empirically only show up right around the time that your uh, civilization is getting wiped. Um, and that, that raises the difficulty level, but it's not like we have turned the best minds of three generations to these issues and they've come up empty handed empty handed. It's right. like we've turned like uh like a few dozen like weirdos and nerds who are like able to be compelled by these arguments ten years ago to these issues. Right. And you know, now we're turning like a few more people uh to these issues. But like I am not saying like and there's some great technological feat um that needs to be pulled off. I'm saying there's like a normal technological feat and meanwhile everyone's like scurrying around doing something else instead. Mm -hmm. Okay, where the normal technological feat does have these extra difficulties of like you can't do as much empiricism, which may be enough to push it over the edge of like humans couldn't do it, but like in in large part it's just underserved. Sure, sure. When uh, the last few moments of our Paul Cristiano episode, we asked him like, "Why? Well, right, what are the bottlenecks? What are the constraints to solving this problem?" And his answer was uh, interestingly not funding. It was talent. It was supply of of brain power. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah. Um, or at least funding I mean, was a lesser problem. Like, you can always, yeah, like, money's fungible. Mm -hmm. Uh, and although it's tricky because it's only fungible to a degree, uh, like, you do have issues if you try to put in a lot of funding that you, like, start to distort the incentives and get people who are, like, showing up right. who... Gr grifters. Right. You get grifters, and you also have, like, legibility issues where, uh, like, are you distorting the field towards the legible work um uh and away from the like less legible but potentially more important work i basically think you shouldn't worry about that at reasonable monetary scales right now but you should just maybe to start really dive about into that. that problem you're saying legible versus illegible where the Ill illegible is just like hard to understand hard to comprehend but actually technically correct and then uh, or in particular like hard for a grant maker or a like funder to evaluate whether you succeeded oh, right okay right. so like, like if you can read the paper and it's simple to understand the grant maker might like, oh, let's fund that. 
but it could actually just be a wrong path on the on the the death apple tree. Uh, yeah, and like, uh, I basically think you shouldn't worry about this. You could, with sufficient amounts of money, get into these situations where, like, I start to worry that you're distorting the field in that way. Um, uh, but I I do think I think I think talent's lacking. I think there's maybe two kinds of talent that are that I consider to be relatively different that I think are lacking. Mm -hmm. uh, one is just like more hands on deck trying to understand how these AI systems that we have today work. Mm -hmm. Like we're starting to make like fledgling minds. They're doing stuff that we can't do by hand. We don't know like like we couldn't program similar capabilities by hand. We don't like know what the like algorithms, data structures type stuff. We don't know like what uh like we don't know how these things are working. We know how we built them. We know how we got them to work. We don't right. know like internally how they're working. Understanding that would give us quite an edge in figuring out like how to point minds at things on purpose. Uh, and uh, I think we sort of want all available hands on deck trying to do that stuff. Uh, and then I think that separately there are questions of like, uh, like, uh, like I sort of, the, the alignment problem, I think, can basically be factored into, this is like not quite true, but it's like a fine first approximation, can basically be factored into one challenge of like, how do you sort of make an AI that wants X for some X of your choosing? And then separately question of like, what X can you put in there such that like you're happy with what happened? Uh, there's like a bunch of additional issues where the additional issues are like, how do you make it uh, be able to like do one thing without a ton of side effects you didn't want and like then shut down uh, rather than like you know prevent you from turning it off so it can verify forever that it's successfully completed its task or whatever like there's right. there's issues of like how do you uh, and and that's sort of like a whole separate pack of concerns but uh, uh, you know many people sort of think the problem is like what would you ask an ai to do such that the results would be good but it seems to me the problem is much more like how do you get an ai to do to like care about what you want it to care about right. in the first place uh and that seems to me like it takes a, a different and often less legible type of research uh that i think can totally be informed by understanding uh how the the current ais work mm -hmm. uh these these sort of like directions go hand in hand. But uh, one of the big things I think we're missing talent wise is the sort of person who's like, uh, like, has the like, uh, like ambition and the gall to say like, I just can take a swing, like figure out what the hell is going on with mines, how do mines like, end up caring about things or pursuing things or like having preferences uh, or like having targets. How does that work? Like, I think that I can like figure out how that works and how to direct it. Mm -hmm. uh, like humanity does not have a theory of minds in this way. We do not have right. a theory of like minds that can be pointed. And it's probably not for lack of that theory being possible. Uh, it's probably for lack of like just having gotten there like science wise. Uh, and you can sort of come at that from one end, which is just like figuring out how the things in front of us work and then like trying to learn what you can about minds and learn what you can about aiming them. Uh, I think there are also other ways to come at that um, that take much, I think, less legible research and like more like independent visionary sort of research. Although I think you need a bunch of, of vision to uh, make progress in figuring out how, these, how, the, how the current systems work. But um, that's, that's another place where I feel like we're really hurting for talent is those like ambitious visionaries who just think they can take a swing at the whole like alignment challenge. Okay. So when you say, say we fast forward to the future and we've solved the alignment problem, um, cause that's the only future that we'll have to be able to reflect upon this question in the future. Uh, is there, is there like going to be a statue of a person who's going to be like, they solved the alignment problem or is it going to be like a team of people or is it going to be not even like a moment where like AI alignment solved and it's just like the alignment problem just dies by a thousand cuts? Do you have any sort of mental model for this? Um, like I think these things, uh, I think it's like pretty unclear. Like 
And and part of the question doesn't come down to how does it happen, but it comes down to like how do humans attribute things? Uh, mm. Like, uh, <clears throat> like it's it it does seem to me like historically a lot of like big theoretical insights, a lot of like paradigm shifting uh, theoretical developments uh, end up attributed post hoc to individuals um, like. Uh, Newton or like Einstein, uh, I think there's like a bunch of truth to this. Uh, I think, you know, we also want to count like Riemann and Laplace. Um, Names and, that we don't know and that's kind of the point. But that helped out right. like uh, Newton and Einstein. Um, <coughs> uh, that or I'm getting my like L names mixed up. I, not, not actually sure it was Laplace. Um, but also the point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, like Surely it will be an effort that requires lots and lots of people. Surely it will be an effort that requires like many insights from many camps. Surely there will be huge amounts of like uh, individual labor, much of it probably thankless, mm -hmm. from like uh, people who show up and can work on like the shovel ready projects that scale with labor. Right. Whether there will also be like critical insights that come from like uh, geniuses that like change the paradigm. Uh, I think my guess, if we like condition on getting to a future where the problem was solved, my guess would be yes. But that guess is like a little bit distorted by like, how did we get out of the hole that we seem to be in? And like, well, probably there was like some force that like made things go a lot better than it looks like they're on track to go. And like lone geniuses are the sort of force that can do this. Um, if you're just like looking for probabilities that it takes lone geniuses, seems hard to call. Sure. So the bankless audience is sufficiently large to the point where I'm going to say that there's at least one person listening to this conversation who's going to be like, I'm ready to dedicate my life to solving the AI problem. What advice do you have for that person? Uh, where should they start? How should they get started? It's tricky. Uh, there's um, like <clears throat> a lot a lot of the people that I'm most excited about have come in from very different angles and have their own sort of like novel perspectives on the problem. Uh, I'm like generally much less uh, enthusiastic about like some people, some people come into this problem and they're like, let me read everything everyone's ever written about the problem and like try to synthesize it and get a sense of like where things are and then like work from there. And other people come in and they're sort of like, you guys are obvious idiots. You haven't checked like the obvious things. The obvious things are these things. Like, let's try looking at it this way. Let's try doing like, and like, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll like send my research around and people can tell me where I'm like being obviously dumb or like retreading past mistakes. Uh, but like, I, I'm starting with the assumption that like no one here previously was like on the ball. I tend to be more optimistic about people in the latter category. Right. Uh, I tend to think... We need a creative solution. Like creative solution and like someone who's more like, I can obviously have ideas about this myself rather than like, let me make sure to integrate everyone's previous ideas so far. Like everyone's previous ideas so far haven't solved the problem and also many of them are kind of dumb. Mm -hmm. Some of them mine. Uh, <laughs> like... Uh, <clears throat> like... Uh, Uh, like, at the same time, there's sort of like a bunch of context that I do think people need and it's sort of hard to get. Um, like, what are good intro resources? Uh, like, um, my guess is that, like, the Less Wrong Wiki has a... AI alignment intro resources page. And if you Google like AI alignment intro resources less wrong, you'll find like a collection of a bunch of different intros people have written. Uh, and then you can maybe like find one of those intros that like resonates with you. Uh, it's hard. I don't, I don't really know how to onboard people. I don't really know where the people who come in and are like, I have a chance of solving this whole damn thing come from. Uh, but I, th I think I think my advice would be like maybe look around on the internet for some resources that that you like, and also maybe like. 
Well, it just sounds try like to it's a dark forest. Yourself. It sounds like it's a, there's no guide. There's no university path. There's a dark forest that you have to get through. And if you get through the other side to be able to be competently talking about this thing, congrats, you're there. But also the whole problem itself is also a dark forest. That's, yeah, that's, it's definitely part of the issue is that, and it's not for lack of like a guide someone wrote on the internet. You know, there's probably like at least half a dozen of those. I sort of don't think any of the guides are very good. Uh, like this field is like, like, like a, yeah, you're totally right. Someone who can solve these problems needs to sort of be able to like go off to the frontier where things haven't been done before. Right. Uh, and part of that is like even getting to the, to the beginning of the problem at all. Like it's a, it's a skill you'll need. Although I'd love to be able to like get people to the beginning of the problem more rapidly. But it, it does feel to me a bit more like um, trying to like figure out physics pre-Newton rather than trying to figure out physics in the days where we have phys physics classes. Right. Like right, there's right. not, there's not a, there are, there are people who have tried to write intros. There are people who have tried to write like open problem lists. I don't think they're great. You can find them on the internet. Like try to develop your own intuitions and approach the problem as if like, we know very little because we do, in fact, know very little. Okay, so that's that's if they want to direct the, the solve the problem head on. Um, I know that I don't have the mind to to apply my skills to this. So what do I do? I do podcasting. What about some secondary skills and secondary efforts that people could uh, to to help solve this problem? Um, I uh, like. There's, I think there's a place for uh, regulation on these matters, which pains me deeply to say, given how well regulation has uh, done on various issues in the past. And, you know, I think, I think many harms in society come from uh, overregulation. But, uh, <clears throat> like, it seems to be humanity's only tool for uh, going to a field that, like, self-professes largely that it has a decent chance of killing literally everybody mm -hmm. and saying like, hey, maybe like back off on that until like we understand what we're doing well enough to like do this job properly. Mm -hmm. I would love humanity to have tools that weren't regulatory uh, for this. Um, uh, and like if I was trying to design the coordination mechanism, I would be like uh, trying to handle it with like uh, like liabilities rather than laws uh right. but well the problem is sufficiently large that the costs of regulation are acceptable uh that's what it seems to me uh although i say this with sadness and right. so uh like that's a whole track where you know i'm no expert in uh how to get regulations to be actually like narrowly targeted and good but um you know i think there's a bunch to be done there. I think most people will also be like, well, I don't have like the mind or the ability to go into like politics where it matters at the moment. Um, and I'm not sure going into politics is, is the right thing there, but that's another area where people, uh, where I think there's like work to be done. Um, that takes a different, that draws in a different skill set. Uh, uh, I like if, if people think they have an edge in, like, the education problem, uh, in, like, uh, like, writing up the basic arguments in a way that, like, reaches a different sort of audience or is, like, more compelling to a different group of people or is, like, uh, more modernized or something, I think these are all, like, uh, fine things to be doing, um, like... Uh, like, for example, you seem to me to have noticed you have an edge in, like, talking to folk, like, uh, helping, uh, like, the the sort of arguments and the recognition of the issue reach a broader audience. I think this sort of stuff is great, draws on a different set of skills. Um, for a lot of people who don't have, like, one of these three opportunities, I think there often isn't an easy way to help out, you know, reality does not need to give everybody a, like, like the laws of physics don't care about you. They can just like drop you in a, in a world that is like, uh, under serious threat of destruction while not giving you an easy 
thing to do about it. Um, and I think like there's a skill to sort of like not losing a bunch of sleep over it, not getting terribly depressed about it, like looking around for where you can help. And like, uh, if you can and you want to, uh, because you're like, believe that there is like, uh, a big threat here and you care about averting it, then like, hell yeah, I respect that. And if like you look around and you can't find good ways to help out such as life, mm -hmm. uh, keep an eye out and like, no need to get depressed about it. Psychologically, how do you deal with uh, d this this looming problem? Like, when you wake up in the morning, are you like, ah, shit, we're going to die? Or, like, how do you deal with this mentally? Uh, I mean, I have, for a long time, not had much faith in humanity's ability to coordinate. And so most of the emotional blow, most of the update for me uh, was in late 2012 when I became persuaded on these issues. Uh you know, it's it, it's it's not like uh, I was like, oh, AI is interesting. And then, like, over time, as I saw humanity, like, go down paths that seemed to me, like, quite derpy and, like, fail to take the problem seriously and handle it appropriately, my probabilities went down. I sort of, like, I think correctly just, like, guessed early on mm -hmm. that probably humanity was going to be pretty derpy about this and go down false paths. Uh, like, I love derpy as a technical term. <laughs> Uh, like I, I sort of like try not to make predictable updates. And so like there was a day in late 2012 where I was like, oh, geez, like I was wrong about a lot of, like I was wrong in my previous pursuits. I missed like the biggest problem heading toward this planet. It's like kind of embarrassing that I wasn't able to figure it out myself. Like I thought of myself as like trying to go for the world's biggest problems. But when I was like 14, I intuited what seemed to me like the world's biggest problem and never like sat down and tried to make a list of like what other like problems might be bigger. I was just like, obviously coordination is the biggest one. I'll like go for the throat on, throat on that and like needed some other people to come along and be like, hey, have you noticed this intelligence thing and how it like is the primary factor determining the future and how humans are not at the maximum of intelligence and like are on their way to make like other intelligences that won't by default care about anything nice. And so there was a day when I sort of like that argument hit me. I like my probability of a, of a wonderful future dropped from like, you know, uh, like mid nineties to mid tens or like mid zeros, I guess. Um, and I mourned, uh, and, uh, then I like didn't feel a need to like psychologically focus on it a bunch after morning, mm -hmm. like you mourn and then you try to save your civilization. Uh, there are still many times, like it's not on my mind when I wake up. There are still many times when I'm sad. There's still many times when like I see something particularly beautiful or particularly moving or that I really quite like about like this planet and my species and like sentient life more broadly. And I like shed tears about it, uh, but it is not a dominant psychological factor uh, as opposed to like it's a deep source of sadness but uh, I'm not like constantly wallowing in it sure. I don't really have a question here but um, I will say that say there's a 1% chance of solving the AI alignment problem that doesn't just mean that we don't die though it means that actually a the all of the negative side of the AI alignment problem, the kill the kill us side, inverts and it Absolutely. saves us and yeah. produces the inverse the level of bad turns into a level of good. Absolutely. That yeah. we've never seen before. Totally. And so there's something there about just like maybe that one percent of, of saw the chance is so small, but the good that comes out on the other side of that is really, really good. Uh I mean that's what we're fighting for. Mm -hmm. But no no stronger reflections other than that. Uh I, I do think people often underestimate just how good things could get. Uh, like, uh, like w one, 
One place where I prefer talking to most people in AI versus talking to people from the more general population, at least uh, in uh, like America and especially like more Blue Tribe, is it seems to me like there is a big meme of misanthropy, uh, especially like among the Blue Tribe of like maybe humanity isn't worth saving. Maybe like uh, like humanity has done maybe too much harm. Maybe we are the source of evil. Maybe we're the source of evil. And I do think that we are like the, uh, like basically the only source of evil around. Like mosquitoes are still edging out humans for the top killer of humans. Well, the Mosquito Malaria Alliance, really, uh, which uh, I'm personally offended by and think we should uh, wipe mosquitoes off the map. Uh, <laughs> so that we can be number one for killing humans. Um, <laughs> and also the number one in killing mosquitoes. <laughs> and also number one in killing mosquitoes. That'll show them. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, like, I, I would not dub malaria evil. I would dub, like, the Holocaust evil. Right. Uh, like, uh, we are the source of evil. We are where all of these ills come from. Um, you know, we are, like, destroying large swaths of the environment and, uh, like... Uh, that is sad. Um, but we are also like the source of, uh, like love and beauty and friendship and art. And like these things also aren't like, uh, universally compelling. There isn't like a stone tablet in the stars that says like, love is great. Uh, the reason that we have uh, the reason that we care about like love and friendship and like uh, hope and fun and enjoying ourselves is because these were the correlates of fitness in the ancestral savanna where our species evolved. Uh, and the particulars of these emotions and feelings and things we care about, those particulars depend on uh, the specifics of our uh of our development. Hopefully some of them overlap with various aliens, uh, but probably not exactly. And it's very unclear how much, it's very unclear how other evolved aliens, how alien they will be. Um, but like those, those things are also in us uh, and they're also from us. And we might be the only source of that in the universe. Uh, and we might be, we are, we are very likely the only source of that within, you know, a hundred million light years. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, like, we also know about ourselves, that we appreciate the, the fun and that we don't like the misery. We can look at ourselves and be like, wow, like, we don't like the evil. Uh, we, and, and, you know, it's subtle. We're like, we, it would probably be a tragedy to remove like sadism from humans entirely, but we're like, well, we want ethical sadism, right? Like pair your sadists with some masochists, have it all be like, uh, like consensual and within the bounds of like ethics. Uh, like, uh, it's, it's not just like, we don't want to, like there is, there is some of our inheritance. Some of our inheritance is in, is like very adjacent to the parts of ourselves we don't like, but we also can look at ourselves and see that we don't like, that in aggregate, we like have these negative consequences, these negative externalities that no one intended. We can look at ourselves and say, we don't like uh, the impulses in us that lead us to like great atrocities. Uh, and humanity, like the future I think does not look like a similar mix of humanity's virtues and humanity's vices. As we get smarter, as we get more capable, as we get better at solving coordination problems, as we get more time to think, as we get wiser, as we, we become more who we wish we were, like we on purpose uh, uh, like promote our virtues and demote our vices. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, is it tricky? Yeah. And do we know what a wonderful future looks like? No, it's it's like very subtle. You can't just go around giving everyone everything that they want. This like, uh, or like solving all the problems. Like part of life is having like, uh, like obstacles to overcome and having like real choices that are meaningful uh, and so on and so forth. But like we can... Uh, we can make a world that is kinder, where the obstacles are, like, 
more meaningful where you don't have like terrible things happening to good people for like where the only reason is that's the laws of physics. Like everyone, like many people, people say like everything happens for a reason. They sort of believe they live in a just world, but things don't happen for a reason here. Like we can build a world where like your trials uh, like tend to give you things that were worth the trouble that like pay off later and that you were glad for. And we can build a world where like uh, children are dying unnecessarily and needlessly because they were like, were born in the wrong part of the world and got some terrible disease we haven't solved yet. Uh, and we can do so much better than that. Like if we, if we like, you know, transcend the, the bounds of humanity with like, like the technological limit is huge. Uh, like I'm an old school transhumanist and like think we should do something at least as cool as building Dyson spheres. Although maybe there are like better ways to put your stars to use. <laughs> um, like I'm, I'm looking forward to the Matryoshka brains. If we like decide that's worth the effort. Uh, like there's, there's so much potential. There's so much potential that this, uh, species has as one of like, uh, perhaps the only, uh, source of like love, friendship, happiness, fun in the universe. Um, aliens may have other things and we'll care about that too, but it might not be quite ours. And if there are aliens, they're probably distant. Uh, and like we can solve so many problems, especially if we have smarter friends who are trying to help solve them with us. If we can get, you know, artificial minds that are significantly smarter than us, significantly more capable than us. And that also are into this great project of like the glorious, like transhumanist future full of like flourishing, happy, civilizations having good times. There's like, I can't, I can't describe the future specifically for you because I expect it to look like foreign and weird and strange to me and be full of people like pursuing desires that like I don't recognize. Uh, but there is so much upside and like, yes, humanity has a lot of darkness in it too, but like, that's just one more obstacle on our way to the glorious transhumanist future that is easier to overcome if you have smarter friends. That was, that was beautiful. Um, Nate, uh, thank you for just articulating what we get out of solving this alignment problem, because not only do we get to not die, but we get what seems to be kind of the inverse of that. Uh, so thank you for, for walking us through um, everything you're doing and why the fight is worth fighting. Totally. Cheers. Mantle, formerly known as BitDAO, is the first DAO-led Web3 ecosystem, all built on top of Mantle's first core product, the Mantle Network, a brand new high-performance Ethereum Layer 2 built using the OP stack, but uses EigenLayer's data availability solution instead of the expensive Ethereum Layer 1. Not only does this reduce Mantle Network's gas fees by 80%, but it also reduces gas fee volatility, providing a more stable foundation for Mantle's applications. The Mantle Treasury is one of the biggest DAO-owned treasuries, which is seeding an ecosystem of projects from all around the Web3 space for Mantle. Mantle already has sub-communities from around Web3 onboarded, like Game7 for Web3 Gaming and Bybit for TVL and Liquidity and OnRamps. So if you want to build on the Mantle network, Mantle is offering a grants program that provides milestone-based funding to promising projects that help expand, secure, and decentralize Mantle. If you want to get started working with the first DAO-led Layer 2 ecosystem, check out Mantle at mantle.xyz and follow them on Twitter at 0xMantle. Introducing Polygon 2.0, the value layer for the internet. For too long, the limitations of blockchains have held back app development and stifled user adoption. The internet allows anyone to create and exchange information. What's missing is a value layer that lets anyone exchange, store, and program value. That's where Polygon 2.0 comes in. Polygon Labs has unveiled a series of innovations that will radically alter the Polygon ecosystem and Web3 as a whole. By leveraging groundbreaking ZK innovations, such as Polygon ZK EVM, the next iteration of the best in class Plonky 2 proving system and a first of its kind ZK powered interoperability layer, Polygon 2.0 will give users and devs unlimited scalability and unified liquidity. Right now, there is a Polygon improvement proposal regarding a potential ZK powered upgrade of Polygon proof of stake. If approved, Polygon proof of stake would become a layer 2 ZK EVM Validium. So make your voice heard on this proposal by joining the Polygon Discord today. You have a chance to help the Polygon community give the internet the value layer it deserves. 
Are you planning to launch a token? Is your token already live? And are you granting your employees and contractors vesting token awards? And are you trying to figure out how to take care of taxable events for your team? Toku makes implementing a global token incentive award simple. With Toku, you will get unmatched legal and tax support to grant and administer your global team's tokens. Toku will help you navigate across the life cycle of your token from easy to use pre-launch token grant award templates to managing post-cliff taxable events with payroll. For legal, finance, and HR teams, it's a huge complex task to have to comply with labor laws, payroll and tax obligations, tax reporting, and crypto regulations in every country that you employ someone. It's difficult, time-consuming, manual, and costly, and it's drawing more attention from global regulators and governments. Toku makes it simple for leading companies in the space, Protocol Labs, Hedera, Gitcoin, and many more. So if you want some help navigating the complex world of token compliance, go to toku.com slash bankless or click the link in the description below. Bankless Nation, we are here at Zuzalo, and I'm talking to Dare Tehran. Dare, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Dare, you want to just uh, explain for people who don't know who you are, uh, where you are and what you're up to? So my name is Dare. I am currently leading the AI Objectives Institute. We are a nonprofit research lab focusing on the question of alignment. And uh, we are interested in building what tools would be able to add value to the current ecosystem to bring the future that we want to be in. So an institute that is focused on uh, solving the alignment problem sounds like that people who are at this institute believe that the alignment problem is existential. Am I, am I on the right track here? Yes, very much so. Okay, so we've been beginning all of our AI interviews with just asking the guest, what is your percentage of AI doom, of percentage likelihood? My personal percentage of AI doom is fairly low for human civilization to end totally would be quite low. I would give it to 2-5% to while for us to end up in a future that is not desirable, more so existential risk rather than extinction risk would be very, very high given the current dynamics we're living in right now. Okay, so existential risk, can you measure, so we, we uh, chance of death low, chance of significant disruption and displacement in the hierarchy of life high. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay, and so like could, maybe you could illustrate like what that looks like. Right. Uh, what what is your likely scenarios here? The core principle that has brought the AI Objectives Institute together was that the AI revolution, as we call it, um, can bring an unprecedented level of flourishing to human civilization, but the current systems we are living at in do not place us on that default path. We currently have a lot of incentive gradients that cause power to be concentrated. We have misaligned incentives in the form of nation states to corporations to attention economy that distract humans from what we actually want to focus on. The AI systems right now are learning and copying these behavioral patterns causing much more large-scale disruption in the landscape. And this propagating further, the doom scenarios that I am most concerned about do not look like nanobots crawling all over us all of a sudden, but look much more like economic failures, institutional failures, environmental failures, as we know today, at a much higher, much more unpredictable rate. And we already have mechanisms to deal with these things, but we do not know the scale at which we will be coordinating for this. Okay, so you listed off a bunch of existential crises, right. and you're, I think you're saying that just like AI is going to accelerate crises that are already in existence, rather than creating a net new crisis, although you're leaving some small amount of room for that. Right. Uh, the bigger issue is that there are already human crises that we have that right. we don't have solutions for, and right. AI is going to accelerate those. Exactly. I think the main crisis that I am most afraid of is in the shortest term, within the next two to five years, we will have massive disruption to the institutions and systems as we know today. We see AI as an optimizer, and we have already other misaligned optimizers in the landscape. They do look like markets and corporations, they look like nation states, they look like you know, misaligned incentives that has driven mass scale invasions that we're experiencing in the last you know, two years with Russia and Ukraine, to massive bank collapses, to voting systems that end up in gridlock. These systems will be exacerbated in a pace that we are not yet familiar with. And that's to, in our perspective, from the AI Objectives Institute's perspective, there is a very strong continuum rather than a sharp break between human misalignment, as we experience today, and AI misalignment. Until we solve human alignment, talking about a purely AI alignment system feels superfluous, in my opinion. So you're saying that solving alignment, there needs to be a correct order of operations there. 
And before we look to solve AI alignment, humans need to first look inward and solve our own alignment first. That's kind of the take. I think AI tooling, in fact, can be quite helpful for us to solve alignment at its base. And there is a lot of cross-pollination that I think is necessary between understanding how we as humans so far before AI have been able to keep certain systems in check. Be it you know, being able to give corporations a legal entity that can be interacted with, or the way nation states have different systems that are checks and balances for each other. Um, there is a lot of value to be driven from how AI alignment research can feed into current systems at have been experiencing different levels of misalignment and how these systems and how we have dealt with this can feed into AI alignment. We see this as one central problem that AI is learning from. To put it in another spotlight, solving AI alignment, being able to align AGI to a specific set of human values and perspectives actually doesn't solve human alignment problem, it just pushes the problem from a silicon substrate to the socio-technical substrate, in which case it might be much harder to control. That's a really interesting. Could you, could you just elaborate on that? Because like there are some human values that we want that I think I can uh, claim without evidence that we think are good, as in like, don't kill me, right. uh, and things like that. Right. And so like, but I think what you're saying is like, uh, if we uh, go further down like what we think are good, we'll start to get into the very subjective realm. Right. And if we start to align AI without defining what humans think are good, we can run into a problem. Right. Okay. Uh, so my, my next question is like, it's still a problem if the AIs come and kill us. <laughs> right. Right. And so like, maybe I'm, maybe I'm a little bit lost with how to proceed here, but like, right. It, there seems to be an order of operations problem of which problem do we solve first, right? Right, and so how do we even define the what problem human, space yeah, the that problem we can space. solve? Yeah. Uh -huh. So there's this concept of differential technological development. What is most important here is to decide on the order of operations of which problems can be solved first so that they can shed light into the next problem. This is like developing cars before seat belts are invented is more risky than understanding if we are to develop cars, we should have seat belts. The question of differential technologies are, what are the technological pieces that make sense to tackle first so that we have the right substrate on which we can build the future that we want to build towards? So this is what we focus on at the AI Objectives Institute. Um, what are the pieces that will be able to yield a safe aligned AI downstream? And what are the pieces that are necessary right now to build first? The center of all of this is a coordination problem. I actually define existential risk as a failure to coordinate at the face of an existential risk is what makes existential risk come together. So there's a lot of tooling that we are focusing on right now on scalable coordination. There's a lot of tooling we're focusing on epistemic security and systems of alignment. These are three avenues that I think need to have much more research so that we can mobilize together. We can identify the loopholes in our thinking as individuals, as collectives, and as systems so that we can bring a level of systems alignment to in line with how we want humans to proceed. Only thereafter, we can start contemplating the scale of AGI. Now, I think it is quite a ways away for we still have enough time to be able to have by the time AGI arrives for us to have built an in institutions that are built on the backbone of scalable coordination and cooperation. That is why I think there is a lot of hope for us to be able to avoid total catastrophe. And I'm interested in thinking of it from that angle, which I think is quite necessary in the current alignment landscape. What are tooling that we can build right now that will bring an incremental net good? rather than talking about what we should avoid, what we should not do. I would like to bring light to the world what we should do, what we should be focusing on today. Okay, so it's your position that AI in the short term is going to produce immensely powerful tools. We can use these tools to help humans with their human problems that they had before AI ever came on the scene. Exactly. One of those things is human coordination. Uh, and so we can apply AI to solve human coordination. Mm -hmm. Hopefully this all happens before the AI doom uh, alignment problem manifests that Eliezer talks about. Right. And the idea is that we race to use AI tools to align humans amongst other existential crises, including our own ability to coordinate. Mm -hmm. And then we will be able to solve the AI alignment problem more head on. Is this more or less your roadmap? 
Yes, I would say that the AI alignment problem is more or less the same problem. It is the natural extension of the human alignment, human coordination problem. So because we cannot coordinate as humans, we can't coordinate on the AI alignment problem. We do not have mechanisms to identify what are the sets of values that an AI system should be aligned to. And I think it is quite short-sighted to say, let's just pump in more text to large language models and at some point they will be able to figure out. A more detailed, you know, I'll go into the weeds a little bit. Solving single to single alignment is technically easy and saying, you know, if we have one unitary agent that is able to be superhuman and super intelligent, they will figure out what is best for us. So we should fully focus on that. I think this is quite faulty. I think by the time we get to this stage, there will be many narrow AI applications that will be strong enough to actually put humans in a catastrophic risk. So we need to actually start from there. What will these narrow tools look like at the hands of uh, misaligned state actors? What will these look like at the hands of, you know, exploitative corporate behavior? How can we make sure we can have safeguards around these as humanity, as a civilization? And will those tooling actually bring a better AI future? That is the intersection that we are interested in. I think the answer is there. Okay, so the idea is that like modern day, late stage capitalism has produced large scale corporations that are misaligned with humanity in general. And then you give them super powerful, narrow uh, artificial intelligence and they just become misaligned faster. And that's like one, one model, one application of where this right. could go wrong. And there's perhaps like five or six or seven more right. examples like this. I mean, I would actually argue that we already live in this scenario. This is not the future. This has been happening within the last 10 years. I mean, a couple simple examples. Insurance companies probably at this point have an AI system to decide which um, claims they should reject immediately because they are least likely to be followed up on. One could say, well, this is the insurance company's job and they are rightfully doing this. To me, this is actually a fundamental alignment problem. We already have an optimizer system inside another optimizer system that is the insurance company that is rejecting claims that is causing human lives to be potentially at risk. And we have devised a society that has normalized this behavior. We have devised ways in which, you know, a corporate company, like companies are able to hide the environmental externalities that they are building to the world, to the landscape. The questions I ask is, are AI systems able to share world models with us that will be able to have us understand these externalities better, to be able to incorporate that into fundamental decision making? To put it in more fluffy words, can AI systems and our understanding through these tools elevate our sense of what humanity wants to be so that we know where we want to go? That is why I am hopeful about being able to build a future. This requires a lot of coordination. This requires a lot better epistemic security. This requires much more thinking about how do we want to envision the institutions of the future. So maybe you could um, uh, just illuminate some of the strategies that you right. are working on at the Machine Objectives Institute. The AI Objectives AI Institute. AI Objectives Institute. <laughs> one line, objectives. one <laughs> line that we had on our website for a long while was, our objective is better objectives, which mm. is, um, it's almost tongue-in-cheek, as we do not think AI systems can have fixed objectives. Similarly, humans do not have fixed utility functions. In yeah. fact, the relaxedness of these is what gives flexibility to human evolution of thought, of our coordination, of our ethics. So, in some ways, the name is tongue-in-cheek on that front. But the goal is to come up with better objectives continuously. Right, okay, so what are the, uh, if we could drill down into the details right. of what it takes to come up with better objectives for artificial intelligence, like right. just the details, like if you will. Right, for sure. So we think of the society, let's look at the societal stack from an individual level to a collective level and then to a systems level. On the individual level, the core work is finding individual autonomy and sovereignty through bringing better epistemic security. The world that we're living in right now, especially in the Western world with democracies, a lot of this heavily relies on information transfer. People vote, people coordinate based on the information they receive around the world. Now, we are entering a new paradigm in human communication where most of the content is about to be generated by AI systems. In this world, are we able to use AI systems to bring a different level of epistemic security and confidence to have us understand is the content I am engaging with with a latent agenda? How can I stay true to my objectives as an individual? How can I stay true to my alignment with the continuous flow of 
information that we are interacting with that is constantly fighting to hijack our bandwidth. This at the lowest level is the most important level. A lot of mechanistic um, approaches to alignment assume that individuals have a level of autonomy and sovereignty. They do know what they want. We actually start from that question. We do not know what we want. We do not always take actions in line with our incentives due to bounded uh, rationality, due to myopia, due to just pure distraction. How can we use tooling that comes from the AI landscape for that? So this is the first avenue of research. There's, we have come up with a research agenda that has some specific avenues that we would like to explore that we believe is a net incremental good. I'll go into some of the details on that front. Please, uh, but yeah. first, just to really yeah. just make sure I'm, I'm understanding here, right. you started with the individual. Yes. And I think that was an intentional choice. Yes. Saying like starting with optimizing for individual freedom and autonomy yeah. is a high level goal, a higher yes. level goal than the rest of the stack, which I think we're about to go down. Right. But could you explain just and elaborate on why we start with the individual and why that's important? Individual is the building block of the society. Every decision that we are making ultimately comes down to an individual's ability to understand the world that we are interacting with. We have devices, the systems that we are operating in right now assume individuals' ability to give feedback to a corporation, to a government, through our behavior on purchasing or through our vote. And we cohere around that. Assuming that AI or democracy or media, AI is just one form of superintelligence. We have devised many other forms of superintelligences in human history. Assuming that the individual maintains a level of autonomy and sovereignty throughout this interaction as we live in the world is what has caused the crisis that we already are in. This is not in the future. We already are in this scenario. Let's look at social media. It's the archetype example. In 2008, uh, we thought, you know, this is going to be a revolution that brings us a level of connectivity, of mutual understanding that will heal democracy. Instead, we ended up with echo chambers. We ended up with massive epistemic fracturing with respect to what facts people believe in. We found people that get locked in more to their own bubble echo chambers. We could have foreseen some of these stuff. This all sheds light into, it's ultimately the individual autonomy and sovereignty that is the core building block of civilization. Then the question we ask is, is the AI tooling of today able to bring a different level of epistemic security? Our answer is yes, and this is very worthwhile to be trying out. Epistemic security. So epistemic, uh, can you just define that term? Yes. The information that you are receiving, right. you know where this is coming from. Right. You know, you have a sense on what this information is trying to accomplish or whether it is true or false. How you relate to this information, how you want to relate to this information and how you want to participate in the world given this new information. Currently, a lot of these systems are actually quite shaky in the society we live in today. And we are entering... post-truth world. Right. And we are, instead of securing this, we are saying, let's come up with a level of generative AI capabilities that can flood even more information. Right, right, right. And then we are talking about what will AI be aligned to? The question is, do humans even have bandwidth to be able to share this information? Understood. Right. Okay. Okay, so uh, epistemology, the study of knowledge, epistemic security is uh, just like securing the ability for the individual if so so they have the choice to sometimes people just want to live in the cozy comfort of being fed the information that they want but importantly giving the individual the choice to have access to truth is a basal building block you're saying to talk about the rest of the societal stack exactly and we're going to use ai tools to improve that right that part, that part so a couple of projects we are working on right now on this front that is the core building blocks is um can we use AI technologies right now, AI techniques right now, to be able to inform certain patterns of perception? For example, I'm not even going to go into whether or not the content you're interacting with is true or false. I will instead start from the side. Is the content you're seeing designed to elicit anger from you? Is the content you're interacting with designed to trigger an addictive loop, giving you a dopamine high really fast? Is it eliciting anxiety? Is there a latent agenda in this content? Or is there a subcultural affiliation in the content that you are interacting with? Is it using language that is geared towards a certain subgroup? 
is it repetitive? Is there evasiveness? Is it stating beliefs? Or is it a response to something else? Turns out large language models are actually really good at detecting these kinds of patterns because what they are doing is pattern matching and predicting the next token. So a language model is able to say, oh, this next token is unusual. It looks like the next token, the difference here, is guiding me towards a different future. So this is one building block that on its own is able to add a lot of value to the language. So we're building a prototype called Lucid Lens, which evaluates the content that you're interacting with continuously to be able to guide you into, hey, it looks like you have been on a dopamine loop lately. Do you want to shift what you want to do? Or it looks like you're engaging with content that is extremely repetitive in this discourse. Can we bring a level of intentionality to your objective alignment personally? OK. so. You're building that system. Right. How do you make sure that that system isn't biased? Right. Right. Because like, maybe the maybe the repetitive loop of iterative content is the correct thing, and then you're saying this AI suggests to humans that like, hey, maybe you should get out of your repetitive loop. How do we know that that's not an unbiased thing to do? Right. There's a couple approaches here that we can take. One of them is. Can we ground language models to an individual's own affiliations? There are some people working on this front. The, I'll give a fairly simple answer. A heads up, like something like a Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder that can point out, hey, you might be stuck in you know, a rage bait you know, click scroll for the last while. That check in is in the right context is not harmful to an individual. You might say, yes, I acknowledge that. I want to continue. I want to proceed. I like where I am at. Rather than have there be a sharp judgment of the nature and the quality of the content. But another part LLMs are able to do very well is to um, being able to fetch further information that can give you a larger picture around the content that you're interacting with. Yeah. This is just one of the many avenues. I will zoom back from LucidLens. Another one is, can language models replicate an individual's affinities to the point that they are able to help us stay grounded in a set of objectives that we want to be in? This we, say mind, this we call mindful mirror. is a different avenue of research. You can think of it this way. The first one is about a machine helping a human stay grounded to their objectives. The second one is helping a human stay ground to, to their, sorry, a human to give the same feedback to a machine to say, here are things that I would like to prioritize. These are what is good to me. Having an individ individualized personal language model that is secure, that is not living in a large company servers, but that is completely owned by you, having this to be able to secure your understanding of the landscape of emotions of content that you're dealing with that can help you ground yourself in a moment where you are lost. This is an incredible piece of um, technology that can actually create net value to the society. Okay, so I, I think I can categorize your mechanisms into two different camps. Mm -hmm. One, um, in the crypto world, we use this idea of credible neutrality quite right. frequently. Right. And there are some mechanisms that are credibly neutral, which aren't to say like, hey, what you're doing is bad, but they're just little alerts saying like, hey, you've engaged in very repetitive uh, YouTube rabbit hole type behaviors. Right. I'm just going to let you know that that is what's happened right. without saying anything negative or positive or suggesting a rerouting, just like a, a neutral mechanism to perhaps bring you out of the hole and let you know that this is perhaps a, pa uh, this is perhaps a danger zone or perhaps not. Right. And just for you to be able to step out of your consciousness tunnel right. and zoom out and just like right. a, just like a, like that uh, in meditation, sometimes they ding that gong. Right. Right. And just like, hey, if you're right. lost in thought, like ding the gong. Right. And so like it's a way to just get you to snap back out of it right. if you are in it. Right. And so the incredibly neutral mechanism, right. which we love. And then the other one is being able to customize your own personal LLM to align with your desires. And since you are the one implanting your biases into the LLM, we also feel that since we are not imposing that upon others, we're right. only imposing that upon ourselves, that also checks, checks the box of credible neutrality. 
Right, and I would like to underline one thing, which is that the large language models, the goal isn't to create a locked-in version. Like, there is, there's many uh, fault lines that we can fall through here as we are building these, which is why the goal isn't to launch this as a product at widespread use right away, but to actually approach this from a question of rigorous study to the point that we make sure these tools are doing the things we want to do. What are their failure points? For example, a very terrible way to do this would be to cause individual value lock-in in which case, you know, a language model constantly reaffirms things to you from your right. past state to the point that it prevents you from moving forward. I am more interested in a language model that is able to give me awareness of my drift through my own evolution of thought. These are some of the aspects that are actually very fundamental to the question of alignment. How, are, how is the landscape of values shifting? for an individual. Then uh, how can, am I changing as a person? Right. Uh, what was important to you? There's a series of simple questions. Are my beliefs consistent with my beliefs? Are my beliefs consistent with my actions? Are my actions in consistency with the community that I'm living in and their beliefs and their actions? Being able to have visibility into these, these systems are incredibly fractured right now and we are building even more walls. I believe AI tooling can actually help us overcome some of these to be able to understand, oh, looks like what I wanted to do, I am not able to do it given the incentive gradients I am existing in right now. The crypto world has suffered from this quite a bit. Um, how can we have this be more visible to everyone? I believe questions of contemplating what values do we want AI systems to be aligned to, etc., really require a level of rigorous understanding of self first. So this is the first step. Then we move to the next category, which is how can we scale this up to the question of a collective, which is the next tier in human society. Right. And, yeah. and before we get to there, I just really right. want to drive, a, drive something home. Right. It really sounds like we're trying to allow AI for humans to become the best versions of themselves. Right. Right. If we want to talk about some, like, uh, some, um, some people in the psychology realm, uh, Nietzsche would call this the Ubermensch, right? right. Like the Uberman. Uh, the Superman, the the best, the literally becoming the best version of yourself, because mm -hmm. that also scales up in society, right? If you, right. as an individual, become the best versions of yourself, that makes you a better community member, and that makes communities better, which right. I think is kind of where this idea goes. I call it extended cognition. Mm. If I am able to have an ability to understand myself cross-sectional through my own history, based on what I have engaged with, based on what I have thought, what I have written. That is powerful. We can act some of like the scariest applications are also the most worthwhile. If this data is compromised in any way, that also creates, you know, a mirror of me to exist in the society. So then the question becomes, how can we do this in the most secure manner that is really within your own autonomy and sovereignty? Because we already live in a world with very difficult attention economy, that everything is competing for your attention, for your beliefs, so that you can vote or so that you can purchase a certain way. It's very important for us to be able to bring a level of autonomy to the individual as AI tooling proliferates in this landscape. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's move up the, the social stack. A community right. comes next? Yes, collective. Collective. Uh, question here is scalable coordination. I, this is where I am most passionate about. I think there is incredible value to be added here. In some ways, you know, there's many alignment labs. We do share, you know, our concerns are in line with a lot of the other spaces like Miri or Redwood, where there is massive challenges that are coming in. And the question is, how, why have we not yet been able to coordinate at a scale where we have lined up our incentives as a society so we can tackle these AI problems. Instead, we ended up in a race dynamic where you know entities that are spun up to counter end up participating in the race dynamic. For this, being able to level set the understanding of what is true across every participant, being able to bring visibility into what are different perspectives that exist in society right now, how can I engage with these more effectively, how can we come up with collective decision making systems so that a collective can find its alignment. The first category was about an individual finding their alignment. The second category is how can a collective find their alignment. So uh, you, you corrected me when I said community and to replace it with collective. Right. I think the reason why you did that is because like a community seems to be like a, hand, a, a handful of people, right? A right. hundred people or a thousand people in a town. Right. But a collective is like 
the hive mind of these people. Yes. And that is the thing that we are trying to produce alignment for. Yes. Is that my, my, that's my interpretation? Yes, and I would say I am in a collective with a lot of people that are not in my community necessarily. A community is a more intimate collective, right. um, depending on how... And you can say, you know, well, there is different ways to cut the social strata that we live in to say, you know, these are different categories. All of these are valid. The thing I am interested in is, say we're able to align AGI to one human. What do we align AGI to now? How can we come up with definitions for collectives? Right. Yeah. We uh, recently did a podcast with a guy, uh, Tim Urban, on mm -hmm. the subject of liberalism. Yes. And he had this great illustration of um, higher mind thinking versus lower mind thinking. Right. And then higher mind is like a genie and lower mind is like a golem, right? Mm -hmm. Like just like a golem is just like dominant punches and right. a genie is like magical and mm -hmm. higher. And then when you have collectives, mm -hmm. if you have a society that is a society dominated by lower mind thinking, right. primitive mind thinking, like right. reptile brain, mm -hmm. you have a collective golem. Right. But then if you have a society based on higher mind thinking, higher order thinking, using their uh, more recent parts of their developed brain, their, their prefrontal cortex, then you have a collective genie. And this thing as a, as can actually, even if it engages with a different collective genie, so you have like the Republican genie and the Democrat genie, two genies can actually make progress together, right? They can actually come together and, and produce a roadmap, whereas two golems just come and fight. And so this is actually a similar subject that we've had on the podcast and maybe a way to illustrate this. I see some parts of this to be in line with our thinking. Um, the way we have been developing AI systems are much closer to a golem right now. Um, I'll get in. I'll get into that. Uh, Hence, the downstream problem of AI alignment is human alignment. I see right. it. Right. Um, I have thoughts on how to make AI systems be more like genies as well. We can get to that in a little bit, but uh, to not to uh, change course of the discussion. Sure. Um, one of the projects we have on this front is called Talk to the City, and this is a digital town hall that you can summon out of unstructured feedback that you have collected from a polity. We currently have voting systems where you're sending one bit of information to the government every four years, mm -hmm. and you're hoping that they will be able to represent this the best. Mm -hmm. We have been used to categorical information on voting, multiple choice, uh, and referendums. The question is, am I actually able to share my perspective in its real, uh, more true to my own perspective, through human language, and have a central entity receive this information and make decisions based on this information. Talk to the City is a prototype that collects different unstructured text feedback from the entire community that we are looking at, synthesizes into a set of different perspectives that exist in the community, and train conversational language models for each of these perspectives. Mm -hmm. So that you can have these perspectives talk to each other, or as an individual, be it you know, you're a policymaker or a journalist or just a citizen in this city, um, be able to engage with all of these reasons why. The goal here is not to find consensus. The goal here is to understand different viewpoints so you can make sure you can address these. In some ways, one of the problems that we would like to solve, and this again goes back to the real alignment problem, it is easy to find the lowest common denominator across everyone. Right. And that causes a lot of short-sighted policy making. That causes a lot of, I mean, political theory, seeing like a state explores this in depth. Um, I am listening I've, to- I've read that book, by the way. Right. Great book. Yeah. It's incredible. It's yeah. very helpful for shaping our thinking. I am interested in being able to understand a more in-depth policy. How is this going to actually impact people? What are the reasons why this may be bad for some groups? yet still creates a Pareto improvement over the current state. These require a level of sophistication that isn't about saying, okay, looks like everyone agrees on do not kill humans, so let's codify that. Right. Okay. Can we actually understand, okay, but I'm interested in having more resources for my village, and this requires a compromise with um, something else. If the proposal is, you know, should we build a road from A to B, yes or no, the answer might be we should build a road from B to C. And being able to give a community to express this and how this be received systematically is something AI tooling can actually bring to the landscape right now. That can bring a different level of collective coordination capability. So, okay, so it's, it sounds like at the individual level, we have these language models that can be perhaps perceived as like our personal assistants 
mm-hmm. our personal, like our series, our, right. our Google, our Microsoft Cortanas, right. to help us think and help us know and help us learn. Right. And then that can um, amalgamate to a higher order right. L- LLM right. that, like you said, doesn't come to consensus on our behalf, but allows us to see when you aggregate everyone's personal assistance, what does everyone believe? And it processes that data of individual beliefs into uh, something for us to reason about and understand and move forward Yes. Uh, now that we understand that. Right. I am not interested in the genie that no. you're talking about to make policy for us. Right. I am interested in this system to be able to show us these are the considerations we need to take into account that people have voiced. Mm-hmm. This is something that AI tooling can help us with today, right now, which is why we are building it. And that brings a level of scalable coordination and cooperation capability. Another aspect here is to finding positive some outcomes that individual groups may not have been able to see. You know, the solution to, you know, should we build the Keystone XL pipeline? The right answer might be, well, a hydroelectric dam will still bring the same energy and workforce to the region without actually having an environmental pollution cost. So it can produce emergent, um, emergent optionality. Right. And these are things that the systems we are building are actually really good at. Um, I would rather not yield the level of reasoning and decision making to an AI system. But in the near term, we are able to use these as building blocks to improve the capability for humans to cohere with each other. Now, what's really interesting here is we are getting two birds with one stone if we build these pillars. The first one is these tools are net good for humanity. We need these right now to, be, to solve human alignment, to take a step towards human alignment. But also, these tools will create data sets for AI alignment as well. It will be able to show how humans have cohered around decision making on specific world models or have humans say, yes, this AI system actually was able to represent me through time. We currently don't have this data, yet we're talking about solving AI alignment. Don't get me wrong. I do think, you know, mechanistic interpretability and a lot of machine alignment research is incredibly important as well. We also need to look at what does this mean for humanity? Otherwise, we will just push the problem of alignment downstream and make it much harder to solve. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, so, so what you're saying is like when we have this collective consciousness that we are able to reason about via mm-hmm. all of our native large language model assistants coming together and powwowing about what everyone right. believes, we'll start to be able to lock in some beliefs. Um, we'll probably lock in the idea that killing humans is bad. Uh, that'll probably happen pretty first. Everyone will come, will be in agreement about that. So then we can use that shared understanding that killing humans is bad as a way to codify that into law about uh, AGI, right? And then we pre- perhaps can go higher from there and be like, okay, now that we understand that everyone believes that killing humans is bad, we can also lock in that theft is bad. And then we can start to get higher up the stack of what we believe and then use that to operationalize more powerful AI? Is that the, the, the path here? I very much disagree with that framing, actually. Oh, no. Okay. Please help me. Under, help me understand. Yes. Um, value lock-in is a concept that is well explored in AI alignment and effective altruism and similar landscapes. The goal is not to lock in values. The goal is to build systems where people, the polity, is able to continuously give feedback and participate into an ever-evolving consciousness. Instead of one AGI that has learned the moral code and then can proceed, what is necessary is a system that can continuously take feedback from people as the value landscape shifts, as more unpredictable events happen. This is, actually, the crypto world has lived through this many times, as you know, the incentives shift, as speed of you know, progress shifts, all the way from gas fees to coordinating you know, how purchases can be made. We need systems that are actually resilient towards updating based on how the landscape is changing. So I, am, I would be quite worried about building systems that can learn and fix something in place perpetually. Much more so, I would be interested in systems that are trained to fetch new information, to understand how the ground is changing throughout time. Most humans, 
I mean, some values I hope we perpetually agree with, such as do not kill, do not cause harm. But then again, what does harm mean? Mm. What does this mean in case of you know euthanasia that you know might be an opt-in from the individual? How does one proceed? We already are living in a world where we are exploring these kinds of questions before AI. The AI systems, I think it's quite dangerous to force the AI systems into, you need to find what the optimal version is and enforce it to the rest of the world. The right way to go is build an AI system that can learn from humans on where humans want to go at any given point and bring us towards there and have there be a level of corrigibility. So like, uh, there's a rule of thumb that I've come to understand in the crypto economic world, which is called um, no magic numbers. As in, when you build a crypto economic system, if you just pick a fixed number, that is a point of rigidity and fragility. Uh, and I think that's perhaps what you're saying about when we train our AIs to be aligned with us, any sort of rigid or fixed parameter right. can create fragility and long tail uh, consequences that we don't understand. Right. Okay, so we're, so we're in agreement there. Right. And so, okay, so you didn't like when I was saying like, hey, all the agreements, uh, all the humans agree that killing's bad, let's lock that in. Right. Uh, maybe I'll rephrase and say like, in this one moment of time, all of the humans of a local collective, uh, all in that one moment of time agree that humans are killing is bad, so the AI that's reading that data will, in that moment of time, choose to not kill humans. Is that a better way to uh, yes, describe it? Yes, and I would rather have us have systems that don't necessarily give AI the ability to be able to kill humans in the first place, but more so see these as the tools that they are. They are super intelligent things we can consult and learn from and iterate from there. But yes, the AI systems values should be able to evolve as human systems evolve. Okay. And it's really downstream of human autonomy and sovereignty into collective decision making that can bring the systems to be able to be aligned. Okay. So, okay, so we started the individual, we've moved up to the collective. Is there a next step? Yes. What's and higher the up? The last step is systems level. Systems, okay. Systems are more complex than a collective. In a system, we don't only have multitude of people, but entities that have their own capabilities, that have their own agenda. For example, a corporation consists of individuals, but it has goals, it has affordances that go beyond what any of these individuals can do. Furthermore, we have developed systems in the world that you know, don't hold the individuals accountable for the failures of corporations. This is the side where we have seen massive problems with misalignment mm -hmm. throughout human history, both in terms of you know, states, governance, and we have toppled many systems. You know, right. Divine right of kings was impossible right. to overcome, yet here we are. Yeah, right. Communism was the same. Uh -huh. There is a lot of systems that we evolve. We currently operate under a capitalist system that is heavily governed by incentive gradients that have caused a lot of shifts for how even you know nonprofits that are developing AI have shifted their priorities towards monetization and um, productization. So the question then becomes, how can we design systems that can stay aligned to the betterment of the collective, to the betterment of the individuals. Everything goes back to, you know, is this actually producing well-being for the participant? Or is it good-hearting something? Good hearts law, as in, when you pick a measure that becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Right. We live in systems that already do this. Right. This is precisely why we don't want an AI to lock in right. and create rigidity, but design systems that can continuously evolve through that window. Okay, so this seems like the hardest problem. Yes. Uh, it also seems like the frontier of coordination problems that humans have arrived at in our grand, in the grand scheme of things. Right. Uh, and we still haven't tackled that problem. Right. It sounds like perhaps understanding that that's the, the foundation that we are at. Right. We actually might need AI to solve that problem and not be able to solve that problem without it. We haven't solved this problem. Right. One thing I say is... Our work, the AI Objectives Institute, in, in some sense, the word AI is not that relevant. Mm. This work was relevant 300 years ago. I think this world will be relevant, this work will be relevant post AGI as well. Mm. This is a question of how do we design structures, institutions that can stay aligned to the collective? Mm. This is a millennia old problem. Mm -hmm. AI is just the newest building block in this story. It's a very critical building block in this story right. that can cause a lot of damage if we don't do it right. Which is why I have high fears of existential risk. If not extinction risk, but that is possible as well if we don't coordinate. I believe we would be able to coordinate and build better institutions, which is what I want to work on.
But like, do do you think that actually solving the point of like, uh, like, at the systems level, we have borders, and that's kind of like a coordination breakdown. The fact mm-hmm. that different countries operate by different rules and coordinate differently. Yes. And so, and then there's also different economic systems, right? right. Uh, different uh, different systems are di- they're disparate, they're disconnected. It'd be better if there was a single global system, along with all the other problems that we've had with. Uh, Stalinism and other like atrocities throughout uh, the 1900s. Mm-hmm. My my question to you, and I'll just reiterate it, is like that's the frontier of human coordination. That you know, we've solved it at the tribe, we solved it at the at the community, solved it at the city, we've solved it at the nation state level. Haven't solved it above that, and honestly, haven't really solved it completely at the nation state level either. I mean, we haven't solved it on an individual or collective level either, but we right. are taking steps towards all of these. It's solved at. at it's solved more or less at different parts in the stack. Yes. And my question to you is like, do we need AI to take the next step in solving it at a more systemic level? I actually see it from the opposite way around. Given we are building AI AI driven institutions, given the workflow that we have right now will yield institutions that have AI in it, we have to look into how AI will interface with this. If we say, you know, let's turn off AI so we can solve this problem for another right. couple centuries or millennia, sure, we can do that as well. We don't live in that hypothetical. AI is here, it is present. I would ask, how can this be helpful for institution design? Right. Yeah. So is, uh, would you agree that AI, uh, all these language modules, everything we're talking about here, is both the problem and the solution at the same time? It is the problem right now because we haven't yet been able to solve human alignment. Right. Hence, any super intelligence, any mm-hmm. super competent entity that can excel human capacity can be dangerous, such right. as misaligned you know, state actors or right. exploitative corporations. Right. Of course, an AI will be very dangerous as well. Right. So we need to tackle this problem. Right. So we have a couple experiments on this front that are also incredibly important. And these are the monoliths that require much more coordination and help than one group to solve. So our goal is to foster an ecosystem that has many approaches all the way from, you know, crypto is super important, ZK proof is super important on this pillar. Um, We are interested in building a proof of concept of an open agency architecture system that can help an institute Our goal is to showcase that an institution can make decisions based on feedback from a larger collective, based on expert opinion, in a level that is transparent and visible and interpretable, rather than a complete black box. And we believe that it is incredibly important for AI tools building institutions and AGI building institutions to follow this. And also it is important for the AI systems to be built on top of this principle as well. And um, open agency is a concept that um, Eric Drexler has pushed forward. The, a simple explanation would be, can we shift our thinking from agents, which are singular monoliths that have fixed goals, that have low visibility, that have their own ways of doing things, towards agencies, which has different faculties and different um, tasks that are being passed around as it reasons about the world and as it takes actions into the world. Building more open agency systems rather than closed monolithic systems is net good. Designing institutions that operate this way is a net good. And similar to the question of human alignment, we have been doing this for a couple millennia. We have iterated through different governance structures towards more visibility, towards democratic systems. We are going to continue with these paradigms as now AI tooling enters the picture as well. Right. Yeah, I, I, really, uh, I really just want to kind of drill down on like, my understanding of how AI fits into the stack because I think your, your big message that you have is AI is yet another thing that we need to figure out how to align along with all the other things that we need to figure out how to a- a- align. But my so it's quite it's a very urgent one given very the Very urgent one. Right. Yes. And in my mental model is that like if we can AI is unique from the other systems that require alignment in the fact that we can use it it's special. It stand it stands out from the rest of the problems in that if we can align AI, we can align everything else, and we actually might require AI to align everything else so that we can also align AI. 
I would say it stands out in some ways for it has certain capabilities that hasn't been emergent from others. I highly doubt if we can align AI, we can align everything else. We can, ha we can solve a version of AI alignment where you can align a single AGI towards a single set of human values that then can go and rampantly destroy half of the world and we end up in a Thanos scenario or we end up in a Moloch scenario where you end up an aligned AI towards a certain set of values that exploit towards building more and more resource uh, takeover. These are not good cases of alignment. A multi-multi-alignment case where we are looking at there is a polity that has different perspectives. How c and these can be represented as different agents. These can be represented as different general AI systems. I don't only like we are more likely to end up in that scenario already. We have multiple tools. We have independent groups that are building many tools. These tools require a level of coordination between each other. These tools need to be able to have their own interpretability to the people they are accountable to. So I highly doubt we will end up with one monolith, but the question is, just like how we are trying to solve coordination today, with many, if not AGI, more narrow tools that are still capable of massive damage to human existence, how do we create alignment across all of these systems? Okay. So if you would, uh, Derek, can you like speed run us through the version of the universe that you hope to see. Like if you and everything that you want to see happens, what does that universe look like over the next five to 50 years? Sure. I am excited about the value AI tooling can bring to the universe. We will have systems that will help us discover ourselves better. We will have systems that help us give visibility to our priorities and see how this is acknowledged by the rest of the world. We will have systems that elevate humanity towards what it wanted to be, rather than avoid what we afraid we would become. I am interested in a world in which I understand the participation that I want to make. How does this contribute to the world that I have bandwidth to explore and play? I would like there to be a world where everyone is able to have bandwidth towards the hobbies, towards the joys that they're bringing in to pursue. I want a world in which we are able to see how our opinion counts in a larger system that is making decisions, that is interpretable and accessible. I want there to be more human connection. Ultimately, it's around being able to have humans interface with each other more, not less. That's why the core of this always comes down to the coordination problem. Can we have humans see eye to eye, understand each other? Can we have the AI tooling reduce the barriers, reduce the incentive gradients that are shaping up right now that prevent humans from finding more agreement, more shared values, more shared joys with each other? This is what I'm most preoccupied with. The world I'm afraid of is one that, um, we talk about this a lot in our team, numbers that we have decided to care about are going up and up and up while we don't necessarily have more human flourishing. That is what I'm afraid of. AI tooling can bring us an unprecedented level of human flourishing. The default systems do not place us on that path. And I would like us to go towards there. And I think this is possible. I think the tooling that can be built today already takes massive steps towards here. This tooling, we're interested in building this tooling for humans to use. We're interested in building this tooling so that the AGI labs can adopt an open agency architecture so they can make more grounded decisions on what the collective is interested in, what is safe, what is interpretable. There's a lot more in there that we didn't go into in detail on how we can have systems that can make decisions that are by design safe and verifiable. All of these will be a net plus to the world we are living in. I don't think we will solve human alignment, but I think AI tooling can take a massive step towards that direction. That is the world I'm interested in. Dara, I, I get the um, intuition that you are an optimistic person. Is that correct? I would say so, yes. I think we need more optimism in this landscape so that we can see what we want to do. I think there's a lot that can be done. And I have many fears as well, but I think these fears can be solved if we get to the level of coordination. So, yeah. There, if uh, people are uh, piqued by this conversation and they want to learn more about um, aspects of this conversation, where should they go? Um, check our website, objective.is, that is, um, send an email to our team, hello, what is it, um, at 
chit message to me, I guess, um, dagger at objective.is. Um, would love to chat. If any of you are interested in helping and creating this vision, um, come along. We need many, many folks to bring this together and make it a possible truth for us. So yeah. There, thank you so much. Yeah, Cheers. thank you.